This session is Offshore Race Management with Simon Dryden of the Ocean Racing Club of Victoria. This session was recorded for the Sail Melbourne Race Official Seminar 2023. Unfortunately, this presentation is missing some audio due to technical difficulties. We apologise for any inconvenience this may incur and have included the slides referenced during this time. The race director for an ocean race is working with your organising authority and working out how you're going to manage an event where it's likely as a race director it'll happen on a weekend. There'll be no commodores, no support staff for anybody to support you in your decision making and you have to make important decisions. To give you an example of my first um, a race that happened recently, I said to a guy, you can be the race director, it's easy, we're going to Port Ferry, it's at Easter, summertime, it's all good, and you'll have a relaxing time. Well, a gale came through at 80 knots and a boat sank. And so that's the kind of thing that can happen in ocean racing directions, in, in ocean racing. And so it's very important that you sort out with your responsible authority, how you have a decision making structure, what sort of administration support we're making right there. Um, so what? Stand back here. No, it doesn't work at all. Hello, it's not working. OK, I'll just keep going. So it's really cl clear that you have to have the right decision making structure so that you can make the decisions as a race director at the time. Um, the most important part about it is the administrative support that you get while you're managing an ocean race is essential. We have thing called the special regulations and boats have to comply with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of regulations that relate not only to the boat, but relate to each crew member. If you do not have a any administrative support to do that, as a race director, as one person, you will never manage. It's a huge, huge job. <coughs> the next essence thing is communications. So the way that we communicate is largely via a website and largely by email, and we now also communicate by SMS. And it's nothing for you as an individual in an ocean race event to get 10 to 15 emails, SMSs, Facebook reminders, and everything to get compliance around what we want people to achieve. So because you will, only time you will ever see the people in your event is at the finish line. And so trying to change their behavior before they get to the finish line is what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> and the hardest part that you guys don't do is I reject entries before they start. So if you don't have enough crew experience, if you don't have the right boat, you don't have the compliance, you don't do all of these things that you're required to do, you do not come racing. And then we do a thing that we don't tell competitors, but we have a cowboy rating of each competitor. And you will generally have a word with those competitors that are high in the cowboy stakes to talk to them about if the weather's bad, that they might just stay in the pub and have another beer. And they'll come next time when they're more prepared. So what was that cowboy rating down to this thing called? Sailors, what is it? Boat, boat, management, crew. All contribute to your rating. So you're looking at a boat, you say, yep, that's a that's a well-known boat. It's sailed in many ocean races. But then it goes, ah, oh, Paul Pasco just bought it. He knows nothing about it. Right? Cowboy rating goes back up here. You know, whereas the boat was down here. And then you go, oh, he's got all his old mates who sail dinghies. No. So it's essential that you very serious about this compliance and how people place, because do you know what the consequence of what happens when it goes wrong? You are in the coroner's court and it's you. 
And you know how much you get paid being a race director for ocean racing? The same as you do here, nothing. So the essence of this is that you need to be safe and the decision making is around this risk. And so if you see in this little thing here, down the bottom is the likelihood scale. So if it blows five knots, the likelihood of anything happening, pretty low if maybe boat catches on fire, that's about the worst going to happen. And then the consequences on this scale here. And so if you think about this in terms of running a race, if the forecast is for 15 knots and two to three meter seas, you can say that we're gonna be in the low to risk. If it gets to 30 or 40 knots, it's more in the medium risk. If you get a forecast that then says there's a gale, then on top of the gale, there's a sea warning. And so that the waves are six to eight, eight meters or so, where do you think the risk ends up? In that little red square. And if you end up in the coroner's court and you were in the red square, you're gone. And so you need to change your behaviors in the predetermination of where you get to in making your decisions. So as a race director, if you're going to go into go, what are you going to do first step? You're going to postpone the event, right? And so if you've got a well-organized race, you could say, okay, the tide at the heads changes every six hours. So in our sailing instructions say, the start will could be delayed. So we might delay it six or 12 hours, or we might decide that the weather window is too bad that we won't go. For example, we were supposed to go to um, Devonport in Cup Weekend, and the race down was gonna be okay, but the boats couldn't get back. And so we abandoned the race because it was too dangerous to come back. So that's the thing that's most important in ocean management sailing is don't go when it's bad. And the thing that's worse nowadays is lots of boat insurance policy says your insurance is void if there's a gale warning when you depart. Which is kind of scary. <coughs> when you're managing event, one of the things that we do to manage an event is we have um, skeds. And before every sked, the race organization will do a risk analysis. And the risk analysis goes, nowadays it's as complicated as we use a product called Expedition. We suck all the competitors into this program, and then we download the weather into this program, and we've got the polar performances each boat, and we can tell how they're going to go to the finish line, what time they'll finish, but also what weather they'll strike on the way. And the idea behind this is that if you think that they're going back to the red square there, is you going to tell them? And so we tell the competitors that this is going to happen. This is what we suggest you do. And that's the, the essence of it. We've had enough disasters in Australia that every review of the accidents have told us that as race directors, we should abandon the race if we think there's high risk because competitors will pound on without taking that into consideration. So nowadays, if we get halfway, we might just abandon the race, turn around and go home. Just to give you an example, this is the team required for the Melbourne Osaka race. That gives you the idea. And if you look at the things you're probably not used to is we have a weather team. So we have somebody who twice a day looks at the weather for all the competitors and works out where they're going to be and what's going to happen. And in this particular last race, there was a cyclone. And so to manage the cyclone is we made an exclusion zone that covered the cyclone off and made all the boats either pull into a port or they had to sail around the exclusion zone. So these are kind of all the tools that you need to have. Something that you don't have here is called an incident management team. So we have a team that will handle any incident. So if we have a boat that sunk or whatever, they'll deal with AMSA and deal with all the organization. Because as a race director, you're still responsible for running the race and all those other competitors. That's why you have that person. You can see a medical team. And interestingly enough, for most of you, you probably never had to use one of those. 
but in um, races like Osaka, where people are offshore for a long time, it can cause psychological problems. <coughs> and then you can see Paul's name over there, International Jury. And just to give you an example of the beauty of this world nowadays, that was all a virtual jury and it did lots of little protests and problems, but it was during the race and handling requests for redress and all sorts of things. And so it's really important that you have that there. And then the other problem that you have with ocean racing is the finishing can take two weeks. And so the idea that one person could do the fall could be on the finishing boat and handle it, it's not going to happen. And of course, the dreaded media. <coughs> Just one thing I'll say to you with managing media, we used to keep a secret when things happened till we'd manage the situation and then we'll tell the next of kin later. Nowadays, if you cannot control the media anymore and you don't know what will happen. So as soon as an incident happens, so for example, in the recent Melbourne to Osaka boat, uh, boat um, had water and they thought they might sink and we sent all of those next of kin a message that their boat has had some trouble we were managing the situation, but they were informed within five to seven minutes of it happening. Because that's where you control the media story. Whereas if you don't, then the journalists will come and say, why didn't you do this? Can I get the message? You just have to stand up. Oh, I've used it. All right, I'm just going to show you this quick little video. And this is the sort of unique thing that we get in an ocean race is we don't get to run a true start line. The people say, this is the what you should do, and this is where you want you to start. Play. Start line. And they're off for the Melbourne to Hobart. Here they go. Check these boats coming on. Not a lot of room between us and them. Oh my goodness, it's going to be interesting. What are they going to do here? Oh, he's going round us. Is that allowed to do that? Oh my goodness, this is going to be close. This is going to be close. Oh my god! Oh! That was close or not. Oh. oh my god. Shit. Oh, get knocked from behind. Oh shit. Get me out with Alex, 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 Alex. Oh, second coming off second first. Yeah, you get a competition going on here. It's stuck on there. Uh oh. Come on, come on, come on. Okay. Oh my god. Stay away from them. That's a lot of issues. They're in big trouble. They're stuck there. The main's too tight. Let's focus on speed. Yeah, it's just starting to settle down now. Oh. And they're off for the Melbourne to Hobart. So there's some of the joys they get of ocean racing. And so for those of you who are not used to it in Sydney Hobart, they have four start lines to try and stop this. And in our recent Melbourne to Hobart with 50, we did what they did in the Etchells and we put the start boat in the middle of the start line and we put half the fleet one side and half the fleet the other side. And we spoke to the competitors a lot and they were very well behaved. Thank you for watching this recording. We look forward to seeing you at Sale Melbourne 2024.